In this special episode, I'm taking a walk into the wild at home here on the Mapperton Estate in Dorset. We have a particular objective here, which is to create what's called wood pasture, which is a mix of pasture, i.e. areas where large herbivores can come and graze alongside um, individual trees, in particular oak trees. Nature restoration is something which is vital to all our futures. The historic houses that I visit across the UK are exploring ways of helping heal the landscape in their care and allowing nature to thrive. This is a nice area where it kind of gives a sense of those kind of the richness of that biodiversity that we have and kind of an indication of how we want to kind of start to extend that. To, to extend it on, yes. When I married into the British aristocracy, it was the start of a wonderfully exciting journey, but it was also a little daunting. I became a Viscountess, and for an American girl from a small town outside Chicago, that was quite a shock. I live with my husband, Luke, heir to the Earl of Sandwich, and our family at Mapperton House in Dorset. Living in a place like this is a joy, but also a challenge. And every day we're aware that we're preserving a very special part of Britain's heritage. Mapperton has opened up an extraordinary new world for me, and I can't wait to share it with you all. So if you love castles and manors and stately homes as much as I do, please join this American Viscountess as I journey into the British countryside in search of some of Britain's finest historic houses. Here at Mapperton, nurturing this beautiful Dorset landscape is at the heart of everything we do. Out on the estate, on a cold winter's day, my husband Luke explained more. Well, I've dressed the part because it's really cold today. It is. It's freezing. I don't have any gloves and my hands are already going numb. Well, I've got fingerless gloves and this is a snood. It's like a scarf and a hood all in one. It, looks, it works. It looks super warm. Yeah, it I is. Might, it is super warm. It. Super warm. But, you know, I wanted to talk to you because, as you know, I travel around, up and down the country, visiting other historic houses. and. Um, you know, quite a few of them are starting rewilding projects. So they're looking at nature restoration, nature recovery, exactly what we're doing here at Mapperton. But can you explain to uh, everybody out there a little bit more about what rewilding is? Yes. Well, rewilding is something that has taken off in the last few years, following in particular the example of the Nep Estate in West Sussex, where what was once an intensive farm has been returned to nature. And what we're trying to do with rewilding is, first of all, the objective is nature recovery. Yes. You know, it's to get a good balance of species, of flora and fauna, back into the countryside. Mm. Because for years and years, decades, um, a lot of the land around here has been very intensively farmed. And we've lost a lot of our species. Yes, so we have. Since the Industrial Revolution, we've lost something like 50% of our plant and animal species, which is an astonishing number. It is. And um, we've got to find a way to bring them back. So rewilding is, is trying to do that. And it's trying to do that by getting to a point where nature takes control again, so that it's not humans uh, intensively managing the land, it's natural processes that are taking over. But the key thing, and I think of rewilding as having two stages, essentially, is that in the first stage, we have to give it a helping hand. We can't, right. we can't just stop everything that we're doing. And, is it, and do you say give it a helping hand is because we were the hand that also sort of, um, you know, got to the point where we've lost the, the biodiversity of so much of it. And so now we've got to help it out to get to the point that it can do its own thing. Yes, it was our hand that has <laughs> caused the problem in the first instance. And so it is hopefully our hand that is going to help restore nature as well. So in the restoration part of this, we've got to start with certain interventions to give it that helping hand. And those include things here at Mapperton 
like reintroduction of species. Mm. They include some tree planting. We've got some wildflower meadows going yes. in. We've got ponds that we will be creating. All of these things are to help the habitat recover to the point where it can look after itself, to the point where we've got a balanced ecosystem and natural processes will just take over. But it's going to take us at least 10 years to get there. And in the meantime, there's a lot we have to do. Um, one of the really interesting things looking at this landscape is just to imagine how it has changed over the last 100 years. And actually, because of our topography here in West Dorset, um, this has never been really intensively no. farmed. It's just too difficult. You've got all these little hills and coombs, which are the valleys at the bottom, this very marshy land that you can see. Um, and so, can you hear, I can hear a, the woodpecker? You can hear the woodpecker yeah, in the background. The um, Amazing. You can see all of this scrub along the edges here. Now, it probably was the case that on this little part of the field here, um, this might at some point have, have had crops in it. Right. Um, this is what we call improved grassland. And from an ecological standpoint, it doesn't actually mean that it's been improved. It, it means it was improved for farming. Right. And for the most part, what that has ended up doing is providing a lot of grass for pasture. Okay. So you've only got a few different species here dominated um, by what's called ryegrass because it's such a good grass for feeding animals. Mm. But there's very little else going on here. So it's, it's improved grassland for farming, but it's what we would think of as quite species poor grassland. So this is an example of an area that we want to encourage to come back. We want other plant species to come and um, establish themselves. And in particular, what we're looking for is for areas of scrub to develop. One of the key things that the scrub does, so you've got these, these patches of, of bramble around yes, here. Yes, yes is that it provides protection. Well, it provides habitat, obviously, for nesting birds, but it also provides wonderful protection for young tree shoots. Mm. You know, if a tree was to establish itself here, it, it wouldn't would, have a chance. No. It would be munched almost immediately by the deer. deer. That we have <laughs> exactly. Um, but if the tree establishes within one of these areas of scrub, it's got a chance of, of getting through. In fact, you can, you can see, I think that might be a blackthorn over there, come up through the, yes. through the scrub yes. because it's had a chance to establish itself because the deer can't get to it. So um, in this area, on this particular patch, what we need are the pigs to come and rootle up. The pigs are nature's plough. They get under the, under the ground. They, they use their snouts to turn over the soil. And that opens it up so that plant species can establish themselves mm. but it also means that as it warms up um, all of those bare earth areas become wonderful microhabitats for exactly. invertebrates for, for, for insects which of course then becomes food for the birds. It's worth saying at Mapperton that we have a particular objective here which is to create what's called wood pasture which is a mix of pasture i.e areas where large herbivores can come and graze alongside um, individual trees, in particular oak trees. Now you can see we've got an absolutely wonderful uh, English oak over there, also called the pendunculate oak. And, um, but it's, it's on its last legs, it's, it's mostly dead. Right. But, but is that it... tree just standing there is still a wonderful habitat for all sorts of, of creatures. And, um, Oaks are particularly important. They support over 2,000 different species of other plant and animal life, insects, lichens, other plants. Interestingly, when we look at this landscape and we think about oak trees, <coughs> um, we're really thinking about the opportunity for the planting of acorns. And there's a particular bird species here, the jay, that's what it does. It picks up acorns and it goes and plants them. <laughs> Squirrels do the same thing. Yes, yes. And so these acorns are all undoubtedly planted around here waiting to, to come through, but we've got to give them an environment in, in which they can thrive. Now, we're talking about you know, a multi-decade process here, so this isn't going to happen overnight. No. And in a way, we're going back to a landscape that we would have seen 
I don't know, something like 10,000 years ago. We're trying to recreate the, the flora and fauna of that period. And in order to do that, we've got to have herbivores. Herbivores mm -hmm. are the key. Now, we all think of herbivores it's like cows um, that are out there making milk for us and steaks and all sorts of other lovely things. But they perform an absolutely essential function, which is to graze. Exactly. Because unless we graze, we aren't getting all of the benefit of regeneration. We can't simply allow the scrub to take over or the grass species to take over. These different plants are kept in check by the grazers. And so here at Mapperton, we have introduced White Park cattle uh, as our cattle species. Now, these are a wild native breed. Beautiful. We've, we've introduced um, also ponies from Exmoor, Exmoor ponies. Now, they, they graze, but they also browse, which mm. means that they are eating some of the scrub. Exactly. And the ferns and, and really keeping back um, the growth of too much uh, bramble. Um, we've also obviously um, Had got the pigs. some pigs. These are Tamworth pigs. Uh, we've talked about how pigs are so important for the, for the soil. And, um, and so we've got some of those roaming about as well. So the idea long term... And we, and we have beavers. <laughs> we, we do also have beavers. <laughs> beavers, exactly. incredibly important, creating wetland. At the moment they're in an enclosure because in this country they have to be yes. um, kept in an enclosure. Uh, they're not allowed out in the wild. But with all of these herbivores, it means that we've, we're starting to have the right balance, the right mix of animals mm. to keep the balance between the vegetation and the animal species. Right, which is how it used to be. Which is how it used we to be. To, to create the <laughs> optimal environment, the exactly. optimal ecology for all of the other plants and species mm. to thrive. This landscape looks pretty wild as it is. I mean, it, it is already a semi-rewilded mm. environment um, and particularly if you look in that direction where you've got all of these rushes and these marshy areas and all of the scrub but then looking behind us this way it isn't so yeah. my hope over the next 10 years is that we start to see much more of a rebalance of regeneration over here it'd be lovely to spot a small oak sapling in the middle of the field here right so if the hope is to again see something different and more i guess thriving here in about a decade's time how are you monitoring that progress so the key thing is to have a what's called a baseline survey so at the very beginning of the project i.e now we're doing surveys to make sure that we know exactly what vegetation we've got so we've been uh, in fact our son nesta has been yes. has been helping with that we've been going out making little quadrats little squares looking at every single plant species in that square, um, identifying the very precise GPS location so we can go back to exactly that square mm. in future years and see what's changed. Amazing. On top of that, we're doing invertebrate surveys. We've got um, bird surveys going on. We've got soil surveys. We're really interested in the soil because um, in particular, we want to monitor the levels of organic matter, the level of levels of carbon, see how that's changing over time. Because these rewilding projects are fantastic opportunities to sequester carbon, to store carbon. Obviously, the more vegetation you've got, the more yes. you're taking out of the atmosphere. And so this data is a big part of what we are doing here so that over time we can look back and actually say, gosh, we've got some really clear metrics that prove to us that we've improved biodiversity and carbon capture over a period. Amazing. So you've talked about the herbivores and I think many people probably want do to say, say... Do you say herbivore? Yeah, we do say. I think wow. we say in America herbivore. Herbivore or, to me, but yeah, maybe you I, say herbivore. I'm sure. It's definitely herb, well, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> That's a new I'm, one for us. I'm sure that, yeah, because oh. that would be my American coming sense. out here. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I don't think we've ever had that conversation no, before. Anyway, uh, can we go see the herbivores? Because I suspect that those Her watching will want to see the herbivores or the herbivores. Yeah, the cattle, <laughs> the ponies, the pigs. Exactly. Let's see if we can find a couple of okay, them. Great. Okay, great. Have you ever wanted to be Lord or Lady of the Manor and stay in a grand castle or stately home with great friends and family? When I lived in the US, I was fascinated by these places, the extraordinary history, the royal connections, and of course, the stunning historic buildings and works of art. 
I've been lucky enough to marry into one of these families and I now live here at Mapperton, which is known as Britain's finest manor house. But now it is also possible for you to stay in many of these great houses and estates thanks to Storied Collection. Storied Collection offers exclusive hire of private estates and castles across the United Kingdom and Ireland, where the historical significance and legacy of each property are carefully preserved. And guess what? Mapperton is now officially a member of Storied Collection 2. Each historic house within Storied Collection has been handpicked to ensure the highest standards of accommodation and service. They cater to a range of interests, including fishing, golfing, or enjoying guided tours by the owners themselves. So whether you're organizing a grand family reunion, an exhilarating trip with friends, a corporate retreat, or even a wedding, these places offer an accessible way to turn your dream into memories that you will cherish for a lifetime. And it's much more affordable than you think. With a diverse range of castles, manors, and mansions, a stay with Storied Collection is a unique opportunity that is not to be missed. And please remember to mention Julie when booking to receive a £1,000 discount on any stay of five nights or more. Click the link in the description below to explore and reserve the historic home of your dreams. I think most people watching this program right now uh, and who know me know that I do have a fear of cows. <laughs> These are very friendly cows. Look how calm With they are. With pointy horns. Well, horns are pointy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is a truism. Yeah, These, but they are rather beautiful. They're absolutely stunning. These are our White Park cattle. We've got a herd of about 26, maybe a couple more this year. And these are doing what's called conservation grazing. What we're trying to do in a rewilded landscape is to have what's called low intensity grazing. If you've got lots and lots of cows, mm. they're all going to be chewing up a huge amount of grass. And your idea is you want to fatten them up or you want them to produce as much milk as possible. Here, we haven't got the cattle doing that same job. We've got them here in order to manage the grass levels and the vegetation levels at a low intensity. So we've got many fewer cattle per square mile, per right. square kilometre, than you would have on an intensive farm. So low intensity, not a huge number of them, um, but we also want them to do something else. And that is to look magnificent in the landscape. And the reason we want them to do that, which is one of the reasons we've chosen White Park, is because we want people to come and see them. Yes. And see just how spectacular they look here at Mapperton Wildlands. Because a big part of rewilding is about connecting people back with nature and with wild spaces. Um, and we're starting to develop at Mapperton ecotourism, which means we exactly. have safaris. And you know, I love that, I do love that name, safari, because I think we've sort of been um, brainwashed in one sense that a safari can only happen if we go to, you know, Africa or to India. Yeah, who needs and, exactly. giraffes? Who, right. needs, who needs lions <laughs> when you've got stunning white park? Exactly. There's only a thousand of these cattle in the world and it's therefore an incredibly rare species that you can watch mm. on your doorstep or you know fly over and come and see us in Mapperton instead of flying to Africa indeed fly to exactly. the UK. Um, this group here has been on the land for about three years now. So they're, they've really made it their home. Mm. And they're, they're out all year round. So you don't have to bring them in in the winter because they're hardy. Um, they don't grow as quickly as other um, more domesticated breeds of cattle. Well, that's and because they're just, they're feasting off of the land. They're not yeah, being- They haven't been bred to exactly. be fast growing. They're not being well. fed other they're, sort of... Exactly, they're not coming in and, and, and eating animal feed through, exactly. through the winter. So they're, you know, they're surviving on, on whatever's here mm. and they look incredibly content doing they it. They certainly do. Now we have got other animals here, of course. Um, we've obviously got um, the ponies, the Exmoor ponies who are uh, in the field behind us over here. And then on the top field, 
we've got the pigs, mm. the Tamworth My pigs, favorite. who are doing all of the rootling, and we've got some wonderful young piglets, piglets this I year know, as well. So sweet. The idea eventually is that all of these animals come together, and mm. we take out all of the fencing. At the moment, at the start of this rewilding project, we're leaving the fencing in because it's easier for us to control where we want them at this stage. Right. But once we've got enough succession in the landscape, once we've got enough regeneration going on, we will feel comfortable taking out all the gates, taking out all of the fences, and just letting the animals roam, mm. going to the different areas that they yeah. want to go to. Have a happy life. Have a happy life. I think they've already got a pretty happy life. They certainly do. Across the UK, historic house owners are leading the way in ensuring the survival of the natural environment. I visited some beautiful landscapes where nature is being given a helping hand to regenerate. At glorious Elmore Court in Gloucestershire, Anselm Guys is in the process of giving land back to nature. I mean, this land out here was historically was, had been very heavily drained right. um, to try and make agricultural land. So what we've done is we've been breaking the land drains and allowing and letting the land hold the water. So this bit, we're kind of returning it back to, um, you know, what it used to be, which was a wetlands. Which are wetlands, exactly. You know, and Elmore is called Elmore, we think, because it's Eelmore, more of eels, because right. back in the day, there would have been because eels, I didn't realise this until quite recently, they made up more of our diet than all other fish combined in the medieval times. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> so this would have been like a hive of activity. In, yes, know, yes, of, eels of course. And the worst of it. So, and of course, the eel, the eel story is amazing as well, because what we're doing here is by improving eel populations, because of the fact they go to the Sargasso Sea, we're impacting on the biodiversity that's happening in the Caribbean Sea. Which is, so there's this that kind of amazing is incredible this is exciting link between yes. you know doing thing one thing here can have an effect on something and something on the else the world you know how brilliant so it's exciting it's exciting to kind of you start pulling these levers and you start realizing yes the impact you're having well and exactly and i think i think for many people i mean i know i was in the same boat before we started our rewilding project um properly that people think of rewilding as just sort of letting nature go and that's it yeah. and, and I get that but also there's the wetlands I mean we have done stuff I mean, out here we've done wetland scrapes yeah um, and we broke all the land drains like I said so the, la the water doesn't run away and then by putting a scrape it kind of automatically get these ponds and that's bringing in already loads of bird life so we're doing that there and then sort of over this way which is is slightly less low-lying the idea is to allow that to become a semi scrubby 20% woodland cover thing right. over a really long period of time. All these projects are looking to the future for the long term. And in the highlands of Scotland, on the stunning Blair Athol Estates, ancient woodland is being preserved and revived. So Georgie, you've been here working with Athol Estate for some time now, is that right? Yeah, the last three, four years or so we've been engaged with the estates. And what's your role in, in this, this beautiful landscape here? Yeah, so we came in to, to help the estate sort of take, um, shift their, their woodland management into a different phase. Um, so at Athol, they have this really extraordinary history of, of forest management in Scotland where they've, they've really contributed to the development of, of forestry. Really since the 17th century, they were a place known, renowned for their forestry. And that's sort of going right back to some kind of quirky characters where um, one of the Dukes was so intent on expanding the forest that he, um, he would spray seed across hillsides with cannons. Um, so, so, so he would literally shoot a cannon out <laughs> that was filled That's with seed. That's the story. <laughs> <laughs> that is the story. Oh um, yeah, so just finding these really innovative ways of, of expanding the forest at Athol. Right. So, it, you know, there's thousands of hectares now that are established, really quite diverse commercial woods at Athol. And um, a few hundred years ago, they were bare hills. Okay. So they have this real tradition of transforming the landscape here of, of really taking 
and changing the landscape through forestry, through new woodlands. And in the past, that's been with this focus on commercial species of, of growing timber. Right. Now it's a slightly different shift. And yeah. It's going more towards this ecological restoration. Right. So yeah, it's been a real change. So it's how fascinating. And it's almost, I mean, if I don't mind, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there is this real shift across the country in going back to this nature recovery, right? Absolutely. And farming same way, right? Absolutely. So nature recovery, regenerative farming. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we're seeing that real shift across Scotland. Here at Athol, they're making that move. It's not to say they're moving entirely away from commercial yeah. forestry, it's still part of the picture. But, but trying to find the balance. Absolutely, yeah. So that's why we, you know, we're working in areas like this where we have these sort of remnants of, of native woodlands. Yes. Um, with these sort of key species. Where that, they're dotted around. Mm -hmm. And you can see where, where trees have been lost and you have that retreating canopy cover. Um, so the footprint of the forest has been, has been shrinking over the years just through different land uses. And so this is about bringing that shift where we start to regenerate that land to allow these woodlands to regenerate and create more expansive areas of, of woodland habitat that link up and bring all these different benefits that we, that we know right. we do. Right, right, exactly. Biodiversity, Absolutely. all of that. So when, when, you're, when I'm looking to my left here and you can see these sort of native, uh, these are native, right? These are native trees. You think, gosh, what can I do with this? Is that right? Absolutely, yeah. So there's evidence of the way the land's been used, you know, for lots of different reasons, but um, it's been grazed by sheep and right. by deer. Yes, and that's yes. part of the picture here, but um, it's just about trying to maybe shift that balance a bit now so that these woodlands are not lost entirely. I mean, what we see up this glen, up Glen Tilt, um, these remnants, I mean, they're probably the remnants of the first forest to come in post-glacial times, you know? Right. So, the genetic continuity of, of maintaining the trees that we have now and avoiding losing them. Yes. You know, there's sort of that key genetic yes. material yes, that yes, yes, if we lose course. it, it's gone. It's and, gone. And that's that whole, you know, sort of journey through from the glacial time. Yes. So, um, Incredible. And it's about trying to, to, to preserve that. Absolutely, yeah. And when I also look to my right, though, I can see sort of dotted around sort of bundles of logs. Mm. Is that you as well? Yeah, this is part of a big piece of the picture that we're, um, that we're trying to shift in this blend. So this is um, the start of a, a really large scheme, um, a new planting scheme, a native woodland scheme. Right. So that's the first evidence of the fence line coming in, and that will be a deer fence. So we'll be excluding deer from quite a significant area. Yes. For the first sort of 20, 30 years, really, to allow those trees to establish fully in that time. Wonderful. And I mean, for a scheme like this, it's, um, we're talking about sort of 500 hectares or so in size. Yes. Sort of 400, 500,000 trees. Yes, that's um, incredible. Yeah. Because as much as we love deer, they can be quite damaging to, again, new life. Absolutely, that's it. They do then actually browse on these, these seedlings that are coming through and they just, um, if where that happens repeatedly, those trees just won't quite. Right. Make won't it. quite grow exactly yeah. they won't make it and um, so it's just a line it's just especially somewhere where we're establishing a lot of new seedlings it's not just relying on the natural regeneration there's it, you know areas where we don't have that seed source so we come in we plant seedlings and we have to protect them and you have to protect them right so you're you're really helping and aiding in this recovery of nature absolutely that's what it's about yeah yeah, yeah really trying to to kick start those natural processes again bring the trees back into the landscape in these areas and then all the benefits that they're associated with. Like, yeah, as you said, the biodiversity, really focusing in on the soils and how and they the develop. Soil, yeah. The water moving through yes, the landscape. Exactly. Yeah, you know, I think it's really interesting here at Athol. You know, it is looking for a balance, genuinely. It's not a it's not a full shift yes. from you know, from, from the traditional land use to, to just full rewilding. It's it's somewhere where they're trying to find a balance between different land uses, you know, still have the farming, still have your stocking but have your woodlands and right. expand them as well within that wider picture. Yeah, Absolutely. well, thank you, Georgie. This is brilliant. Um, well, gosh, if I could come back here <laughs> in about, what, 20 to 30 yeah, years? You and see I a, might see, you a, see a significant change. difference. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Absolutely. When I visited Castle Howard in North Yorkshire, the spectacular ancestral seat of the Howard family, I met up with Guy Fallon, 
head of natural environment, to understand how the estate is being nurtured for the future. So we're right on the edge of the Northfield Moors, and then we've got this ridge line here, an escarpment, limestone escarpment, which is uh, the kind of foundation of the Howardian Hills. So we sit in an area of outstanding natural beauty. Yes. The location is just idyllic. You know, you have this palace right here yeah. overlooking um, this incredible view of the landscape. How many acres in total? In total, we're uh, 3,500 hectares, so right. 9,000 acres. acres. And about half of the land is arable. 30% is then woodland and right. forest. Right. Uh, and then about 10% is down to grass. So okay, okay. Got, got, kind of quite a mixture, really. So. Yeah, and are you looking at doing any type of rewilding on the estate? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, currently we're looking at uh, kind of all our options, really. Um, yeah, so land yeah. management is probably going through like some of the biggest change yes. that's ever gone through like since post-war, really. Um, so people are looking at how do we manage our land, how do we start to reduce our impact on natural environment, and yep. how do we start to get that land working to address those kind of big land management challenges like yes. biodiversity loss climate change, carbon sequestration, all this kind of yeah. thing. So yeah, it's it's huge time and there's so much opportunity uh, to kind of look at how you change systems, change management plans, etc. Yes, so, yeah. Yeah, no, so we're right at the start of that journey. Um, I've joined the estate and my, kind of my role here as head of natural environments is to uh, start to think about how do we protect, enhance the natural environment that we have? How do we start to bring it more to the fore of the identity of the estate? And then how do we start to bring it into the visitor attraction as well. Of course, uh, so yeah, yeah, engage, yeah, yeah. People, engage yeah. people in it. And so you have this opportunity for, for, I guess, the younger generations to really start to engage a little bit more with nature and the importance of the biodiversity Absolutely. and the abundance that yeah. we need of the biodiversity. And it, it's fascinating because here we, we stand here today and there's uh, house martins flying around. We've got real kind of diversity in the grass, etc. Um, and the way we've stewarded the land and looked after it uh, for the kind of history of the estate has been responsible, has been appropriate. Um, but the kind of ramping up and that kind of conflict between human activities and kind of nature has uh, just kind of been overlooked and is now coming into sharp focus really over yes, the last it, kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. 10, 10 years or so. So we're very much looking at how do we change our woodland plans, how do we change our farming plans, how do we change uh, the way that we kind of look at conservation yes. and how do we start to get those all working together um, so that we can have uh, a far better, more yes. biodiverse uh, yeah, 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 yeah. landscape. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great. So, All right, so where, where are we off to next? We're going to go down and get a bit closer to some of the kind of more traditional kind of components of the Castle Howell landscape, how it was designed. Um, yeah. So we're going to go into some of the deer park where we've got some really amazing um, ancient veteran oak trees. Um, and then we'll go on and have a look at some farmland as well. Okay, great. Yeah. This would have been part of the uh, original deer park, um, right. for which you could just see the wall right in the yes, far distance yes. over there would go up behind this bank of trees. Um, and actually that deer park would have wrapped all the way around the house and the grounds. And that deer park was, was lost and it's kind of been broken up into different parts of kind of grassland and the arboretum and uh, uh, yes. uh, arable farming. Um, but this is a nice area where it kind of gives a sense of those kind of the richness of that biodiversity that we have and kind of an indication of how we want to kind of start to extend that. To, to well. extend yeah. it on. Yes, exactly. And again, just leaving, you know, when trees are felled or they, uh, you know, they sort of die and they collapse. I think, you know, in the past, it would, we'd think we need to remove them. And now we've realized that leaving these dead trees is fantastic yeah, for definitely. biodiversity yeah. and, and for the soil. And so there's like a, unique saprotrophs like uh, saprophytic fungi uh, that kind of live on breaking down material. There's there's ones that are totally unique to kind of breaking down oak and things right, like that. So right. a dying oak can be host to like thousands of different yes. kind of bacteria, fungi. Um, and here we've got uh, some beautiful kind of parkland oaks. Um, some of these, well, most of them predate the house. Um, right. So it would be over kind of 300 years in age. Um, and we've planted some additional ones around as well. Right. Um, but that kind of combination of trees, um, both blocks of areas of woodland, and we've got kind of mixtures of um, ancient woodland and kind of uh, commercial forestry, and then areas where we're kind of spilling in and have these kind of wood pasture, wood meadow type areas as well. Yes. So yeah, that connection between kind of woodland and landscape and those different levels of vegetation are really yeah, valuable. Really, really valuable. And it's about making sure that, you know, we just sort of let nature um, do its thing, do what it's good at rather than competing against yeah. it and wanting to destroy it. It's about letting it thrive because I always feel that if nature thrives, then we as the human race will continue to thrive as well.
Well, where off to next? We're going to carry on following this uh, beck that's just a little stream right down the bottom of here. Right. We're going to follow that down, we'll cut across it and we'll go over to some of the farmland okay. um, where we've got some regenerative farming trials, look at how we're changing systems yeah. and then also look at some of the land that we're thinking about. How do we change that in right. a kind of dramatic way yes, over yes. time as well? Yes, so, yes, exactly. Okay, brilliant. Perfect. So I thought we'd come out here both because it looks insane uh, yes, it and does. absolutely amazing. The kind of br bright red of the uh, clover, the real oh. crimson. Um, but also because it kind of allows us to talk about uh, how things are changing on yes. the estate, uh, how land management is changing. Um, so from a farming perspective, this is an arable field. It may not look like it right now. Um, and here we're trialing uh, some cover crops. So okay. Uh, non-commercial crops, if you want to say that that way, uh, which are part of the rotation and effectively fill that gap between harvest and sowing the, yes. the next crop. Um, so typically over winter, um, this crop, uh, this cover crop, we've got a number of different blocks in here. So you can see by the different colors, um, has gone in uh, after harvest last year and has now come through. So if we were continuing to crop, this would probably be grazed off or sprayed off. Right. Um, and then the next crop would go in. Um, but for now, this field's in fallow for the year. So we're just okay. kind of, uh, leaving it leaving as is. Leaving it, um, yeah. And well, it's quite dramatic. So, it's yeah. so <laughs> dramatic. I mean, it's stunning. It's absolutely stunning just to see this, as you said, this bright sort of crimson color from the clover and, but also dotted around, you know, bits of, um, uh, you know, a light purple. Yeah, you've got and, some vetch in there, and yeah. some phacelia, which is really pretty. Um, yeah. So if it was a sunny day, this would be <laughs> swarming with bees. <laughs> really wonderful. Wow, and so then, exciting. Yeah, so here we're, I mean, you can see the mausoleum yeah. right up the hill. You can see the um, Black Angus herd beneath yes. that. Um, so we're on the kind of eastern edge of the estate here. And this is kind of, the land over here is quite, well, it is wet. So we've got uh, kind of land here, which is pretty marginal and uh, marginal for cropping. So this is some of the, land that we're really looking about actually how do we change and start exactly. thinking about habitat creation here over time and take land out of production that is marginal that, that is needs marginal. a lot of energy to produce a crop right. actually can we uh, use it for better purposes and i think it's about finding that balance it's not about taking all of the land out of sort of food production yeah. if you like it's looking at your land and saying right so this is marginal farmland so i'm better off giving the land back to nature and allowing if you like sort of this increase in biodiversity but also finding the balance and saying right but this part of the estate or the land is you know this is fantastic farmland yeah, and we'll absolutely. keep that so we yeah. have you still have this diverse system in in one sense that you've got the food production on the one hand but also you've got this enjoyable wildflower field yeah. or that you know th that you can come in and visit as well and see as a visitor but also somebody who's really concerned about climate change and biodiversity yeah, yeah. it's sequestering carbon it's holding biodiversity it's improving water quality improving air quality brilliant The kind of landscape that we see now is a really traditional one, um, hyper traditional in this sense, or kind of historic, where we've got ridge and furrow systems in the, mm. the field behind you. You can just see the kind of ridges of the, the kind of um, grass popping up. Um, and then beyond that, we've got farmland, fairly marginal farmland, and then the kind of woodlands beyond. Um, right. So we have a, a landscape that's pretty rich and pretty diverse, but uh, are we using it in the most appropriate way? Can we uh, build more diversity into that landscape? Can we start to look at different uh, farming systems, different management systems? Can we kind of create areas where we're rewilding and kind of introducing various different species for grazing and kind of starting to think about how that whole ecosystem is working and operating? Yes. Nature is messy. Like, yes. uh, and we as humans like things in nice square boxes, nice square fields <laughs> uh, that could be really efficient. But here, it, like to create kind of a blurring of that landscape where the woodlands kind of fall in and you can't really tell where the wood ends and the field starts so that's that's the ambition really yes. here is to kind of start to see kind of nature thriving in this area yeah. in front of us well fantastic and i cannot wait to share some more of the nature restoration projects on the estates of the historic houses i'll be visiting throughout britain here at Mapperton, we have an exciting future ahead, enabling nature to thrive and regenerate. And for regular updates on our progress through the seasons, be sure to tune into our sister channel, Mapperton Live, or book yourself onto one of our rewilding tours.